morning. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dan Drusselhaus. Uh, Drusselhaus is obviously not a super, super common name, so I've included this handy pronunciation guide for you. Um, I'm a software engineer at Salesloft, uh, where I get to write Elixir, which is awesome. Uh, we are hiring, so um, definitely feel free to come chat with me afterward about that, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, I've been doing software development professionally for about four years now. Um, and in that time, I've been super fortunate to have uh, friends and mentors who are uh, super intelligent and uh, way more experienced than me, which, which is to say like, that like, imposter syndrome remains very real. Right? But uh, one thing that I've kind of learned about uh, these really smart, uh, really inspiring people that I tend to lionize is that um, they're very good at learning new things. Um, and so that's kind of something that I have to like, try to be like, hey, how can, I, like, how can I get better at learning things? And there are some uh, strategies that I've kind of stolen from a, a previous career. So before I was a software developer, um, I practiced law. And as is kind of the normal uh, course of events before, before that, I was uh, a law student. Um, now, one thing you might not know about uh, law school is that uh, law professors don't necessarily, uh, don't tend to use lecture as their primary pedagogical method. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but uh, typically law professors will, use, will teach using some, some sort of, some variation of the Socratic method to kind of like lead the conversation in a particular direction uh, using questions, right? Question and answers. Uh, now, when I went, uh, before I went to law school, I, I didn't really know what that meant, so, so I'll try to describe it for, for y'all. Uh, you can kind of imagine uh, a large room with 100, 100 students and the law professor uh, sitting in front of the lectern at the, at the front of the room. Right, she's uh, looking over a seating chart and, uh, and she, calls, she calls my name. Mr. Mr. Drusselhaus? Mr. Drusselhaus? She looks around like in my general direction, like trying to spot me. It's, it's not hard, right? I'm the only one who's visibly shaking, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Drusselhaus, please recite the facts of Martin V. Herzog. All right, so I have like a couple seconds to kind of like regain my composure. And then I, then I start reciting the facts of the case. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the plaintiff was, was driving a buggy at night. Uh, and the defendant was, was riding a car, or driving a car. And they were kind of approaching each other uh, on the road. And uh, the, the defendant veered into the oncoming lane and, and struck the plaintiff. Um, but the most interesting uh, fact in this case, maybe, is that the, the plaintiff um, was, was supposed to have headlights installed on the buggy. And, um, and he had failed to do so. Uh, so the question, the, the question of the case is like, was this failure to comply with this statute, was that to be weighed as evidence of contributory negligence? Um, like essentially like, was the plaintiff at least partly at fault? Uh, so after the, the recitation of the facts, often the professor will ask about uh, the history of the case, like what had happened at the lower courts. Um, so this is called procedural posture because lawyers have to have a fancy name for everything. Um, so in this case, uh, the trial court, which the state of New York quite unhelpfully calls uh, the Supreme Court, um, held that like violating the statute should be weighed as evidence of contributory negligence. And uh, on appeal, the appellate division like reversed the trial court's decision. All right, so then we get to the, the holding of the case that, that I have read, the opinion that I have read uh, for, in preparation for the class, and that's the opinion of the Court of Appeals. And in this case, the holding of the Court of Appeals was, was a reversal of the appellate division and saying, yes, the, like, this violation of the statute should be, should be weighed as evidence of, of contributory negligence. So this is kind of the, the stage in the, uh, the Socratic method thing where like, uh, the questions start to become harder, right? We have the ruling and now we're gonna like dig into like what is the reasoning behind the decision. And what often happens here is that a professor will uh, like begin to kind of like push, push you to like uh, to one side or the other, right? Um, 
like causing you to like you want to, they want you to defend a position, and then they're just going to start poking holes in your in your ideas. Um, it's all it's all very embarrassing. <laughs> the one the one thing law school will definitely teach you is to be able to see both sides of every argument. Right? And so I think I'm ready. Like I've I'm ready to fight to defend either side. I think I've got arguments either way. I'm ready to go. Um, but this isn't this isn't the question that the professor asks. Instead, she says like. What if, what if the statute in, in question were, were different? What if instead the, the plaintiff uh, was driving a car instead of a buggy, and what if they were violating the speed limit, right? Um, should that be considered evidence of contributory negligence? Uh, would it matter how much the plaintiff was violating the speed limit by? Would it matter if the reason that the speed limit was set to 55 in this particular case was not for any safety reasons, but because like, we were concerned about fuel economy or something like that? And, and this, like, this bit right here, this is the brilliance of the Socratic method. It's like we identify the variables and assess how like, changing them affects our understanding of the whole situation. Uh, so a bit, of a bit of a sidebar here. I, I really like flowcharts. Um, I remember as a 1L, <laughs> I remember as a 1L, my, my first year of law school, preparing for exams and I sat down this is my favorite flowchart. Uh, like, and I started trying to put together flowcharts to to help me assess like, like how would I process this like legal scenario, and the problem was that like, often law school analysis isn't just a, a bunch of forks of decisions. It's more it's more complicated than that. A lot of times, uh, like, the questions you you at answer later in the analysis affect like the answers that you, or the questions that you asked earlier. Um, so I would, I would have really loved for like law school exam analysis uh, to have looked like this, uh, but it rarely did. And I, and I would really like for distributed state analysis uh, to look like this, but after we get past the easy questions, it no longer does. Um, so let's talk about state then. Uh, we'll definitely get into different properties of state and how they might push us toward different strategies. But let's start with a most naive of de definitions. Uh, state is just data that we're gonna store and retrieve. Um, you might recall from a second ago that uh, the first step in the law school Socratic method was a recitation of the facts. And I think that can be, that can be helpful here. We'll come up with a test case um, and then we'll push the limits of our understanding by swapping out different variables and seeing how that affects our overall uh, analysis. So for our test case, we're going to talk about JWTs. A lot of people are using JWTs uh, these days for authentication, and JWTs have some really cool properties. Um, they're, they're stateless, right? We can encode data in them, like a user ID or tenant ID or some other helpful information. And then we'll uh, set an expiry and sign the token. And once, once the token is signed, uh, we can be sure that it came from us, right? And that's the cool thing, is that it's stateless, like once it's out there, like we know, hey, this came from us, this is, this is authentic. So a typical use case might look like this. User sends a username and password to us, and then we validate and respond with a signed JWT. Um, and then on subsequent requests, right, they send the JWT saying like, hey, I need, I need data, I need to change these things or, or whatever. And this is, like, this is really cool, right? We get to save a trip to the database because we can be sure that the token came from us and that the data that we've encoded in it uh, has not been tampered with. And this is all cool with, with a caveat, right? There's always a caveat. Uh, and the caveat here is that uh, if the user sends the JWT and like says, hey, I wanna, I wanna go ahead and log out, uh, we don't have like a really, a really great way to do that. We can definitely like remove the JWT from the client, right? But the, tech, the token is like technically still valid when we, when we don't want it to be. And that's, that's not ideal. Um, so the, the, because the token is stateless, we, we need to like, we need to know like how, how do we remove this now? Uh, so probably gonna need to store it somewhere. We need to store the fact of the revocation. And so this like, this could be relatively simple, right? Uh, we just need to find a way to store the token. We could maybe go with a whitelist approach where we store all the tokens and then delete the ones 
uh, that we want to revoke. We could create a blacklist and only add the ones that we are revoking. Uh, but the heart of it, we just need to store the, the token, right? So the question, the question is, where are we going to do this? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what what is our procedural posture? A second ago, we talked about procedural posture. What's the history of the things? Um, and I might I might be pushing this analogy too hard. Um, I tend I tend to do that. But but I'm, what I'm trying to get at is this: uh, if the Supreme Court of the United States hears a case, it's it's not because it was an easy case. It's because something about the facts of that case made it hard to, to apply the current rules to the facts. And so that's why, that's why it's a tough question. Um, and most, most of the time, the question of where to, to put our state is, is an easy case. Uh, so maybe the first question that we ask in our, in our scribe method is like, is Postgres good enough? Right. Or it's, it's uh, closely related uh, in-memory corollary, is, is Redis good enough? In the, in the law, we have this term stare decisis, uh, which means let the, let the decision stand. You might have heard of the term precedent. This is, this is basically precedent. But again, like, lawyers have to have fancy phrases for everything. These are two rock solid technologies. Um, they're tailor made for storing state. And, and we know that they're good at what they do. They've, they've been battle tested. And we, we shouldn't ignore them just because we might like want to eliminate an external dependency or because there's this cool new algorithm that we want to try. Like they're good at what they do. Um, and as much of the truism as this is though, like they're good enough until they're not. Like Postgres is good enough until it's not. If we put all the things in Postgres, regardless of their persistence requirements, regardless of uh, its data shape or access patterns, uh, at some point, we almost come to like a tragedy of the common scenario, right? Because Postgres is so good at storing and retrieving data, we as developers uh, might be overusing it. We might be using it to store data that maybe, maybe doesn't need all the guarantees that it provides. And then we can run out of resources. Um, asking ourselves whether something needs to be in an external service is a question that we can, we can be asking ourselves like pretty regularly especially when we're in an Elixir. Uh, the Beam gives us some really interesting tools. And uh, hopefully this, these tools um, like will let us interact with the data in, like, in more narrowly tailored ways. Um, so let's, let's talk about some of these tools. Um, so here we have like, what might be a typical Phoenix app. And it looks like what a Rails app would also look like, right? Um, but it's hard to be in the Elixir ecosystem for very long without hearing about these really cool things called gen servers. And uh, gen servers can do a lot of things, certainly. But for the purpose of this talk, we can just assume that, um, that all they really do is store state. They obviously do more, but we're just going to say all they do is store state. Uh, they're in memory, so they're like really fast. Um, they're cheap, so we can spin up hundreds of thousands of them on a server. They can manage their own life cycles. They're, they're really cool. Uh, but what they're not, they're, they're not distributed, right? So if we're, we're serving a request here, a request comes into node A, we store some state on node A, and uh, we hope to retrieve that state later on, right? But if this, the next request comes in to node C, like, well, we don't know, we don't know what's going on there, right? Where's, where's the state that I need? Uh, so now we get to like one of the cooler things about the Beam, right? It's clustering, like we can connect our nodes together. Um, Right? And then we can send, send messages between them. Uh, so now we've started a cluster up, and we'll maybe apply a distributed registry slash supervisor, like Horde or Swarm. Um, and then on, on a request to node C, now we have access to the state on node A, which is really cool. Um, like, right, we're getting to dig into some of like, the Beam's distributed computing primitives, and that's, like, that's really cool. But this, this approach does have a couple of downsides. Right? If, the, if the gen server itself goes down, right, we lose the state. If the node goes down, we lose the state. Or if there's a net network partition, we lose access to the state. And then we might recreate and modify the state. And then if, once the partition heals, like we have a, sp a split reign situation. And uh, in that case, we need to know how to resolve those conflicts. 
Now, like, this doesn't mean that this strategy isn't helpful, uh, but I think what we found at, at SalesLoft is that the distributed gen server um, strategy kind of works best uh, as a cache layer for like a more durable base data. The next two uh, strategies that we're going to talk about are examples of replicated straight state. Rather than storing just one copy of the state in the cluster, um, we'll have one copy per instance of the application. Um, and sort of kind of compare and contrast these options, we're going to ask the question like, what are our consistency requirements? And to do that, we're going to talk about our test problem. All right, now we have these outstanding JWTs that people are, are sending in, in their requests, um, letting us uh, authenticate them as users. And let's say in this request, uh, we're, or in this example, we're only keeping uh, blacklisted tokens in the state, the, just the ones that have been revoked. So now we have uh, the users, so now we have a user who logs out, and the request goes to, let's say, node A. Uh, so, and, and let's, let's, let's stipulate here that we don't have any consistency guarantees for whatever strategy we're using. Um, so a logout request has gone to node A. Like we could have immediately another request come to <laughs> node C, and if the state hasn't uh, finished propagating across the replication like thing, then, uh, then we could have like, like potentially an issue, right? But this seems like much less of a concern Right? Eventually it's going to happen and probably, uh, like there, I guess there's definitely a chance maybe, conceptually, theoretically, that uh, the, the initial request was like intercepted by a hacker who was able to make another request before the invalidation was propagated. That's like theoretically possible, right? But maybe practically unlikely and practically not, not a super big concern. Um, so let's change the variables a bit, right? This is like the purpose of the Socratic method. What are, what are the variables we can change? Uh, so let's change, instead of like a blacklist, let's talk about having a whitelist. So we um, authenticate a user on node A, right? We begin propagating that state. We return uh, the JWT to the client and the client immediately begins sending like additional requests for data, right? For like the dashboard or whatever. And um, some of those requests are probably going to nodes B and C and D and Z. Um, but like, that's, that's a problem if like, it, they start sending requests and they're, not, um, and they're not authenticated, right? That's a problem. Um, now, like the, the data definitely has to go, like the JOT when we return it, has to go all the way to the client and come all the way back. And theoretically, you think probably the replication is gonna happen before um, that happens before we get a subsequent request, but maybe not, right? And so uh, when, when we don't have the consistency guarantees, then we might need to um, think about maybe a retry mechanism. Just like thinking about like how do we um, assess like how often this is actually a problem versus like whether it's a theoretical problem. Um, in any case though, like we need to be assessing what are our consistency requirements? Like, when should, we, when should we be concerned about race conditions and how will we mitigate them like when they, when they rise? So let's talk about our first uh, replicated state option, the CRDT, stands for conflict-free replicated data type. Um, I've seen a handful of Elixir and Erlang implementations, uh, but mostly I've played around with uh, Derek Cron's Delta CRDT X. Uh, so DR CRDTs allow us to write a data, or write to a, a data structure, uh, usually like exposed as a map or a set, and have those uh, changes replicated across the cluster, um, which is like, which is super awesome. Um, each instance of the application, each node has its own copy of the data, and will read from and write to um, its own data, even in the presence of network partitions. So we're, we're definitely favoring availability over consistency here. Um, which means like we're, we're comfortable serving stale data. Right? In this example, uh, Node A has received, <coughs> uh, Node A has received an update and would return like that updated state upon subsequent requests. But nodes 
uh, BNC would return stale data here. Uh, the cool thing about CRDTs is that when, uh, when that uh, network partition is healed, uh, they know how to merge themselves uh, back together, which is, again, super cool. Uh, but let's say that these availability trade-offs are not something that we're super comfortable with. Right? We simply can't serve stale data here. Um, maybe, maybe we want to consider uh, a consensus al algorithm like Raft. Uh, Raft is a persistent replicated state machine. There are several uh, libraries written in Elixir and Erlang, including one by Chris Keithley. And um, also there's, a, there's one by Pivotal Labs headed up by uh, Carl Nilsson called RAW. Um, that was a consensus algorithm. Raft ensures that a majority of nodes agree on the things, right? And that they achieve, and Raft in particular achieves this consensus by having uh, a leader. So the leader election process is super interesting. Um, and I'll take like a second to note that the Raft paper is like fascinating and I would encourage you to read it if that's like up your alley. Um, I could probably spend 40 minutes talking about the leader election process. That's not true. Chris Keithley could probably spend 40 minutes talking about the leader election process. Uh, in any case, it's crazy, crazy well thought out. Uh, okay, so a gist of Raft is that each command goes through the leader, which is then sent to each follower. Um, and when majority of the cluster have acknowledged the receipt, receipt of the command, then the leader commits the command to the log and processes the command into the state machine. Um, so here we have a request come in wanting to set the state to eight. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the follower uh, follower C sends the command to the leader who appends, who sends the append command to each of the followers. Excuse me. All right, and as soon as uh, the leader has heard back from a majority of the cluster, um, then the, the leader writes or commits to the log and uh, process or sends out the X. And now we have now we have consensus, which is cool. Uh, but let's say we have another request, this time to set the state to nine. Uh, but in this case, we have a network partition between A and the rest of the cluster. Right? The leader will still uh, send out the append command uh, and then wait for a response from a majority of the cluster. Frozen here. Uh, and because uh, B and C represent a majority of the cluster, we're fine committing to the log and, um, and arriving at a, at a consensus stream. Uh, and so we can note here that like, that A is out of order, or as, as out of sync with the rest of the cluster, uh, very similar to what happened in our CRDT example. Um, the difference is that with Raft, like node A is unable to write to or, or read from the, the state because uh, it can't reach the leader. Um, so we're not worried about uh, stale data in either of those cases. Um, a would just uh, return an error, right? So this is where we're, we're favoring consensus over availability. If we can't be sure that, they're, um, that we're serving consistent, consistent data, sorry, consistent over available, uh, then, we're, then we're gonna return an error. Um, but again, as soon as the partition heals, A's logs are brought into sync uh, with the rest of the cluster, which is super cool. Um, this, this looks chatty, and it, and it is chatty, right? So it's not gonna be super performant, um, and it's probably best used for like maybe tooling rather than application things, maybe. Uh, but uh, playing around with uh, Pivotal's uh, Raft implementation, there are definitely some ways that you can speed things up if you're so motivated. Um, but there are some caveats there in that it's tricky, it's like complicated stuff, and there's just some overhead that is inherent in the algorithm, uh, specifically because Raft has persistence uh, guarantees, um, which say, segues nicely to our next question. What, what are our durability requirements? So one thing that we kind of have to say about uh, this question is that it's a bit of a sliding scale. Um, it's kind of squishy, I don't know that there's a lot of good data about like, like what products, what technologies have the best, uh, best like durability guarantees. Um, obviously, certain 
uh, certain products are going to be favored over others. Um, but it definitely feels like there's kind of a perceived hierarchy of durability. Right? In terms of like long-term durability, RDS and its competitors are just like a feat of engineering. Um, what like what they're able to do, um, but but also like Redis and Elastic Cache, like these are like surprisingly robust considering that all the data is stored in memory. Um, now let's say that we had an Elixir cluster that we could um, we could have replicating the state across deploys. Right? So when a new node comes online, the state is automatically replicated to the to the new node. Right. So we have our, our blue nodes doing a little blue-green blue de deploy here. Um, we're taking down the blue and bringing up the green, right? And so like, as we pull down each of the old servers and add each of the new servers, like, the state gets replicated across, across each deploy. So, which is kind of like the ship of Theseus, right? Like, we've swapped all the old boards out, but the state, right, the essence of the ship is still, it's still there. So thinking about this scenario, we can, we can ask, like, how often like, does our entire cluster go down? Right? Certainly a cluster that you're deploying to regularly has a non-zero uh, amount of volatility. Right? We're humans. We push bad code. I'm not saying that a Beam cluster like, has less volatility than, than like a Redis instance, but I am saying that it has more replication than, than Redis in that case. Um, so I guess what I'm, what I'm really trying to say is, like, uh, there's nothing from a technological perspective that would keep it out of the conversation as far as uh, Redis from a, from a durability perspective. So another thing to think about is what is the size of our data? Um, how, how large is our state? Can we reasonably keep it in memory? Um, how long is it going to take to move to, to new servers upon deploy? Um, so my colleague Steve Bussey, who's uh, speaking tomorrow. Uh, he and I were working on a proof of concept uh, using some of these technologies uh, for, for a relatively dumb cache, um, but something that we could still per persist across deploys. Um, and for the kind of the proof of concept, we had a hash map of uh, 50,000 keys. And we found that like uh, the Delta CRDT um, was generally pretty quick to read and write, um, but when it came time to move the whole data structure over uh, over to the new server on deploy, like that was, that was prohibitively slow. Um, now we ended up reaching out to Derek on GitHub. Um, he was super responsive and has merged in several PRs kind of addressing some of the concerns we had, which I haven't had a chance to test out yet. Um, but in any case, this is something to like think about. If we, if, when you start to think about uh, migrating data across deploys, like assessing how long this is gonna take is, is a big deal. Um, I also did the, the same kind of proof of concept with, um, with raw and found that the, I mean, the, the reads and consensus, or the writes and consensus reads were, were slow as expected, uh, taking over three, three minutes just locally to populate uh, 50,000 key value pairs. Uh, but when adding a new server, um, as you would with a deploy, the raw performed quite well, um, presumably thanks to like log compaction, which is, which is a cool part of the, the algorithm. Um, I think it's probably a good place to mention that, like the fact that, as I'm kind of describing these algorithms, um, I haven't really touched on the fact that, like, the libraries might include some functionality outside of the scope of the algorithm. Um, I guess here I'm specifically talking about Raft as an algorithm versus uh, Raw as a library. Uh, one interesting thing about Raft is that you can, uh, is that the read commands are processed like on the state machine, just like writes, but, but they don't affect the state machine, um, which, which slows things down. Um, but it, um, but raw gives you the ability to do non-consensus reads locally, non-consensus reads to the, to the perceived leader. Um, so you can, if you don't need absolute consistency, then there are maybe some other ways that you can, um, you can use these kind of libraries without uh, fully uh, fully utilizing the guarantees that they provide. <coughs> um, so oddly, oddly enough, like depending on our access patterns, raw might still be like an interesting option, even though we would use it not primarily like for its consistency, also like also 
being willing to serve stale data, you can still use the library that way, um, just not fully utilizing the, uh, the algorithm itself. Uh, so this kind of brings us to our, our next question. What are our access patterns? Um, as I mentioned, raw writes are really slow. Uh, even if we're reading with uh, non-consensus reads, if we have a write heavy load, uh, raft might, might struggle, will struggle, uh, or might require us to interact with uh, the state machine in an async manner, which is, which is difficult to do. And one thing to keep in mind uh, about the beam is like, if you have something super read heavy, like ETS can be your, your best friend. Uh, for those of you who aren't, aren't super familiar with ETS or ETS, uh, it's an o OTP tool that is kind of somewhere between a gen server and SQL-ish. Um, so it has better queryability than a, a key value uh, store might typically be. Um, but it, it is also like it's in memory, but it's also faster than, than gen servers, um, especially when you, when you enable concurrent reads. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so you don't, you can, when, you're, when you've enabled concurrent reads, then you don't have to worry about your reads uh, building up in, in a queue in a single mailbox, which is, which is pretty cool. So one approach we've taken at SalesLoft uh, for data that we're okay being eventually consistent is that uh, we can use Kafka eventually, essentially as a, a pub sub to publish to, publish state to nodes and then like when the state gets to nodes, we can just slam those into, into ETS tables. Um, and because Kafka consumers can handle their own offsets, uh, we're less worried that we'll miss data uh, from a network partition. And, again, and if we do have a network partition, once, once the partition is healed, we can catch back up. Um, and this can give us like super wide horizontal scalability with really fast access to uh, the data that we have in those ETS tables. Um, so this is all under the caveat that we're comfortable with eventual consistency. Um, but if you were running like a site with uh, serving up like CMS style content, but that also like changes relatively often. Like I can think of far far worse approaches uh, than this. Uh, so, so by way of recap, these are kind of the six six questions we've asked, asked ourselves about state the state problems we've discussed. Um, and this list certainly isn't exhaustive, uh, but hopefully from questions like this, we can begin to get a sense of the levers that we can pull, right? We can internalize the variables that matter and what happens when we change them. It's been a bit of time since, I, since I've been in law school, uh, but I remain convinced that uh, one of the best ways to an ex explore a new challenging intellectual space is to identify the most important variables in play and begin to ask what, what happens to the whole system when we, when we change them. Um, distributed state remains a historically difficult computer science problem, right? The beam doesn't like change that entirely, but like it does give us some interesting tools. Um, and right now it feels like we're in the nascent stages of like figuring out how to tackle these distributed problems with these really cool tools. It's not like there, there haven't been like, like Erlang libraries that are like, have been around forever that are also like trying to solve these, but I feel like um, that there have just been a, kind of a wave of new tools that are kind of exploring this space. And, uh, and I feel like we're starting to put together a good tool set uh, for attacking these interesting distributed state problems. And like, I think that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the community continuing to explore the space and like begin to uh, establish best practices um, around these types of things. That's what I have.